You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number eight. Kids and weight, prevention, treatment, or acceptance. Children and their body weight is a complicated topic. In our fit and trim obsessed world, how should the child with extra weight be handled? Today, I explore the ins and outs of extra weight in children and the healthiest approach for managing it. Today's episode is sponsored by the Kids Healthy Weight Project, a step-by-step online food and feeding course for parents of children ages 4 to 14 years old. The Kids Healthy Weight Project takes you through everything you need to know to grow a healthy child with a healthy weight and a healthy relationship with food, including how to handle the common issues that crop up along the way. The Kids Healthy Weight Project Helping parents become great feeders so their kids grow up to be healthy eaters. Learn more about the Kids Healthy Weight Project at www.chillcastle.com forward slash courses. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey everyone, Jill Castle here, your registered dietitian nutritionist and childhood nutrition expert. I hope you are all feeling great and doing well today. I can't believe we are on the other side of school starting and are decidedly heading into the fall. Personally, I love it. One of my favorite times of the year, especially in New England, where you can't beat the fall foliage. Before we get started, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, I wanted to thank those of you who joined me on the free training I hosted this week called The Five Honest Mistakes That Sabotage Your Child's Healthy Eating. I had great turnout, great questions, and I'm excited for all the new students who have enrolled in the course. Just a reminder, if you're considering enrollment in the Kids Healthy Weight Project, it's going to be open now until September 21st. If you're interested in joining, head on over to jillcastle.com forward slash courses. So a mom called me the other day and told me she can't find anyone to help her overweight daughter. Quote, everyone is afraid she will develop an eating disorder, she said, but she is overweight, unhappy, and losing her confidence around eating and choosing food. It's becoming a real issue, end quote. When you think about some of the tough topics in childhood nutrition, topics like picky eating, malnutrition, or disordered eating, to me, one of the toughest topics is weight, particularly overweight and obesity, and what to do about it, if anything. Is prevention tactics, are they enough? Is treatment of childhood obesity bad? Should we approach the whole thing in an entirely different way? That's what I want to talk about today. Before we get started, I thought it would be helpful for us to just go over the background and what we know about childhood overweight and obesity according to the Centers for Disease Control. So there was an article uh, recently published back in 2015 called Prevalence of Childhood and Adult Obesity in the, U- in the U.S. from 2011 to 2012. And essentially, this was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, again, 2015. And I will link to the article in the show notes. But basically, the paper looked at where we are today in terms of overweight and obesity rates in America. And this is what they found. And I just am sort of setting the stage for our conversation. So bear with me on this one. 8% of babies under the age of two have a weight for length measurement above the 95th percentile. And that is uh, the classification we use for being overweight in that population. So we don't use the BMI, the body mass index measurements for children under age two. For children who are age two to five years old, about 8% of them are considered overweight or obese. 
and that is a significant drop from the 2003-2004 findings when the rate was more like 14% for that age group. 6 to 11-year-olds had a prevalence of about 17%, and 12 to 19-year-olds had a prevalence of 20%. In 2011-2012, about 20% of 12 to 19-year-olds were considered obese, and if you compiled overweight status and obese status, the rate for 12 to 19-year-olds was about 34 to 35%. The article also um, highlighted disparities that exist in obesity rates among minority youth, and they found that Hispanic, American Indian, and African American adolescents have the highest prevalence of obesity. Over the past 30 years, the rate of childhood obesity has more than doubled, and the rate of adolescent obesity has quadrupled. However, over the last nine years, between 2003 and 2004, and 2011, 2012, there has been no significant changes in obesity prevalence in youth or in adults. So that's good stuff. But overall, the percentage of children and teens with weight issues are still high. So why do we care about kids and their weight? Well, if you ask a healthcare professional, the likelihood that you will hear um, a worry about health issues later in life is probably pretty big. So healthcare providers, they worry about diabetes, heart disease, and other long-term issues related to weight. Things such, such as high blood pressure, high lipid profiles, orthopedic problems, and psychosocial problems, such as depression or poor self-esteem. These have all been cited as long-term complications to childhood obesity. So when we talk about childhood obesity, there are certainly different movements and approaches uh, to dealing with it. One, there's a movement to prevent obesity. There's also a movement to treat it and a movement to accept it. So that's what I want to explore today. I hold no bias about which way is the best way, although I will share as I go through what I do and what I feel like works for me as a professional and for the families that I work with. And certainly if you don't agree with what I have to say, I would love to hear from you and we can have some more dialogue about that. So when we look at prevention of childhood overweight and obesity, Sandra Hassink, who is a pediatrician and president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, co-authored a report Uh, entitled AAP Updates and Recommendations on Obesity Prevention. This was published in 2015. And she emphasizes in this article that families can improve their healthy eating habits with a variety or in a variety of ways, but it is important for healthy eating and physical activity to be tailored to the child's developmental stage and family characteristics. So when we talk about prevention, what are we really talking about? So I just want to kind of explore that just a little bit. We're really talking about instilling healthy habits, equipping parents with the knowledge that they need so that they are guiding their children in healthy food, healthy balanced eating, healthy lifestyle behaviors. And um, specifically, when we talk about a balanced diet or healthy food, we're tending to talk about the five food groups which I've reviewed before in episode two. We're talking about uh, food balance. We're talking about cutting back on sugary beverages. We're talking about uh, having a policy for sweets and treats. And if you are familiar with me, you know that I like to use the 90-10 rule. I'll share the link in the show notes for that. We talk about more fruits and vegetables with obvious and easy access to them, and we encourage families and children to eat five or more fruits and vegetables a day. We also talk about other things like dining out and eating outside of the home and how that is done in a way that supports health. We also talk about striking a balance with all sorts of food. 
foods that might be considered unhealthy and considered healthy. How do you balance those? How do you strike a balance on a regular basis? And how can you be flexible with those foods? We talk about being in touch with one one's own appetite. We talk about self-regulated eating and so on. There are lots of food and eating topics to discuss when we talk about prevention. But other healthy habits that we talk about are things like physical activity. There are guidelines for children, including 60 minutes of physical activity per day. And that tends to be activity that is more associated with sweating and elevated breathing. Uh, but, But exercise or physical activity should be enjoyable and fun, and uh, it doesn't have to be all done at once. Children can accumulate it throughout the day. Cutting back on sedentary activity, like watching TV or using video games or other uh, computer time where children are sitting for long periods of time, we want to cut back on that. That's a healthy lifestyle behavior. And there are guidelines for that as well. The guidelines are less than two hours of media per day. And I can tell you that most of the families that I work with uh, need to cut back. I think we live in a digital age and children are most definitely using more and more media in their day-to-day life. And it's starting a lot earlier than it used to start. Those healthy, those habits get started and they get going and they're hard to reverse. Um, The other one is sleep, making sure children get enough sleep. There's been a lot of recommendations around adequate sleep and and what's healthy uh, for children. Much of the prevention education should center around making nutritious food choices and engaging in enjoyable activity while developing a healthy relationship with food and one's own body. One area that doesn't get addressed as much is addressing how to feed children. There are some common negative feeding practices that can really complicate the issue of eating and weight in children. These are things like rewarding children with sweets or treats for eating healthy food or restricting uh, unhealthy food to a degree that might drive a child to really seek out that unhealthy food or too much healthy eating talk, which can be interpreted by children as pressure. So I discussed those feeding style and practices and the implications of carrying those out day to day in episode number three. I'll include that link in the show notes for you. Personally, I like to give lots of tips and strategies on how to feed positively or be authoritative in feeding while also tackling the what's and how to's of nutritious food and the why's of child development as they relate to eating. Prevention should be holistic. It should address the whole child. So it should also touch on developing a lifestyle infrastructure that supports health, as I mentioned, sleep, activity, media, and more. But it should also talk about or address building self-esteem and body confidence and self-love in children. But here's the thing. We talk about prevention all the time, but we don't put the cart before the horse. Prevention is often discussed after weight becomes an issue. So I believe prevention needs to start early with upfront nutrition education. It's really no surprise to me that we have taken a reactive position to childhood weight. It's very hard for parents to know how to raise a healthy child with a healthy weight when they haven't been front-loaded with the information they need to be successful. So I do think it's all about prevention, but the question remains, when do you do it? Where do you do it? Who and how? So here are some of my thoughts. Upfront education. I believe we should be educating parents on healthy lifestyle behaviors, nutritious feeding, and nutritious food well before birth. If you take the Lamaze model that outlines that training that you go to when you're pregnant, where you spend six or seven weeks, I guess, learning about how to deliver a baby. I went through that with my first child. Um, We spent a lot of time learning how to breathe and learning how to anticipate what was happening during the delivery and just all the steps and and, uh, all the things that go into delivering a child. 
if we spent half that amount of time on teaching parents how to feed their children and how what to expect with nutrition and and we instilled all those preventive tenets to good nutrition and good growth and and good lifestyle behaviors early on i think that would be hugely helpful the other thing is parents need ongoing education and ongoing support and reinforcement and i believe that should happen at each annual checkup Anticipatory guidance based on age and stage of development can happen through all of those annual physician checkups or at another designated time where parents get this information to help their children. I think we should always be talking about feeding advice, not just talking about food. And I think that we need to find ways to systematize our messaging. That messaging needs to be happening in daycares and preschools and school itself and on the sports fields. We need to get our messaging about healthy living for all children, not children, not just for children who might be carrying extra weight. We should also be teaching nutrition in school in very positive ways. We can incorporate it in the classroom, in math class, science, health, English classes. And think about you know, bringing home economics back where children and teenagers learn how to cook. But above all, these efforts need to be proactive, positive, and empowering, not fear-based, weight-focused, or with stigmatizing overtones. And last, we need to create safe environments that encourage healthy habits, such as access to grocery stores for all neighborhoods and safe playgrounds for all children. So not only are we teaching and we're trying to be proactive with our prevention messaging, we need to create the environment for children to be successful. So there's a lot of potential and possibility for prevention efforts, but we need to focus more on being on the front end, not the back end. Proactive, not reactive. If we looked at the next modality, which is treatment for childhood overweight and obesity, we get into some interesting information that I want to spend a little bit of time on. In my own private practice, I've been treating children who classify as overweight or obese for almost 10 years. I can't turn away a family who wants my help, although I do refuse families who are looking for a diet for weight loss. Yep, I turn them away. Why? Because I don't put children on a diet, and here's why. Dieting is one of the number one predictors for developing an eating disorder. A recent paper published in the journal Pediatrics called Preventing Obesity and Eating Disorders in Adolescence digs into the relationship between obesity treatment and the development of an eating disorder. They write about this because how and whether to treat overweight and obesity and the potential for the development of an eating disorder is a real concern, not only to parents, but to healthcare, healthcare providers as well. The authors note that not all, but some teens who were previously overweight may develop an eating disorder through the process of overweight or obesity treatment. Some adolescents may misinterpret what healthy eating is and engage in unhealthy behaviors such as skipping meals or using fad diets in an attempt to be healthier. Or they engage in excessive exercise, the results of which could be the development of an eating disorder. The paper explores the evidence behind dieting, obesity, and eating disorders and concludes, dieting is counterproductive to weight management. This is so hard for some to believe, but let me say it again. Dieting increases the risk for eating disorders and has been shown to result in weight gain, not weight loss, over time. So the bottom line is steer clear of diets, please. And that's why I steer clear of diets for the patients and the clients that I work with. So You might be scratching your head and saying, okay, so what should treatment focus on then? Well, this article 
gives us some good information that I want to share with you. Uh, To prevent the development of an eating disorder in the context of treating overweight or obesity, the paper states, the focus should be on a healthy lifestyle rather than on weight. So what does that mean? That means, and I will talk about the healthy lifestyle part in just a second, but it means that we don't focus on weight. It means that we are not shooting for a number. It means that we don't attach a value to a specific body weight, shape, or size in our children. That we actually look to the inside of our kids and we value them based on who they are, not what they look like or the size of clothes they wear. So the focus should be on a healthy lifestyle, specifically family meals. So coming together as a family and eating together. The research shows that generally children who participate in family meals have healthier food intake. They are able to see a model from their parents of what healthy eating and healthy food choices looks like. Family meals have been shown to be protective of disordered eating in girls. And of course, it's more together time. And it allows you as a parent to monitor your child's eating and address any concerns early on. Now, I know some of you have taken the Happy Family Meal Challenge that I have available through my email system. So I think I have over 200 families who've taken that challenge. I'm going to include the link for that challenge in the show notes, but it gives you, it's a five-week challenge that each week you get an email that describes a task or a strategy for you to implement for the week during family meal time. The other healthy lifestyle factors that they outline include ditching the weight talk. So comments made by family members about their own weight or comments made to the child by parents to encourage weight loss are damaging. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about weight talk. Several studies have found that parental weight talk, whether it involves encouraging their children to diet or talking about their own dieting, is linked to overweight and eating disorders. Kids and teens who experience weight talk are more likely to engage in dieting, unhealthy weight control behaviors, and binge eating. We want the focus to be on healthful eating behaviors, and when that is happening, teens are less likely to diet and use unhealthy weight control behaviors. Again, weight talk is tricky. Once you start going down the rabbit hole of talking about your child's weight or talking about other people's weight, Um, That can be very stigmatizing and it can be damaging to kids and teens and lead them to thinking that in order to be accepted, they need to be thinner, so therefore they need to diet or they need to skip meals or they need to take diet pills, for example. None of it is good. Another healthy lifestyle behavior that is recommended to address is weight teasing. And I can just tell you right now, don't do it. (laughs) Weight teasing by peers or family members is experienced by 40% of early adolescent females. So we're talking about children around age 12. It's experienced by 28% of middle adolescent females and 37% of early adolescent males and 29% of middle adolescent males. So that's, those are pretty high numbers. Those, we're talking 30 to 40% of children around 12 to 15 are experiencing weight teasing. So for both boys and girls, hurtful weight-related comments from family members and significant others were found to be associated with the use of unhealthy weight-controlled behaviors and binge eating. So again, there's a link here that's undeniable, and we need to be paying attention to not just only addressing the food and activity that kids are eating and participating in, but these other things that are happening as well that contribute to the pathology of eating and potentially even an eating disorder. Last, when you're talking about protective lifestyle interventions, 
promote a healthy body image. Adolescents who were more satisfied with their bodies were more likely to report uh, that their parents' and their peers' attitudes encouraged healthful eating and exercising to be fit rather than dieting. They were less likely to report personal weight-related concerns and behaviors. Again, self-esteem and a healthy body image is really important, and we're going to probably start to see more and more research coming out about this because I think it's a gap in our knowledge, um, not so much the impact that a healthy body image has on a child's uh, feeling about themselves and how that transcends to the foods they they choose and their eating habits, but what we don't really understand very well is how to promote healthy body image and what is really effective, particularly in children. So I always say, you know, you, you have to really know the child because every personality is different and what we just can't make global recommendations that cover every single child. So we do need to know a little bit more about this and I hope that more research will come out to guide our, our efforts in that area. The good news about treatment and prevention is that evidence suggests that obesity prevention and treatment, if it is done correctly, will not predispose a child to an eating disorder. Randomized controlled trials of obesity prevention programs have shown a reduction in the use of self-induced vomiting or diet pills used to control weight and a decrease in concerns about weight in intervention groups. So again, the key is to do prevention or do treatment, which is what we're talking about now, to do it properly. Do no harm. So here's my advice for you. If you're a parent and you are looking for treatment for your child who might be carrying extra weight, screen your potential health care providers and don't use them if they promote a diet for weight loss. Please just run the other way. You want to find somebody who is going to help you with a family-based prevention, healthy habits, lifestyle program, which involves these healthy habits for the whole family. We definitely do not want to single out the child with excess weight. So when a family comes to me and they are looking for treatment, as I mentioned before, I never put a child on a diet, diet and I make that very clear off the bat, and I actually screen my families uh, before I even meet with them, and I let them know that I don't do diets. We won't be putting a child on a diet. We we do healthy lifestyle. We do healthy uh, balanced food and eating and how to balance all foods together. Um, I teach families how to balance all foods, how to keep feeding positive. I teach them how to navigate some of the common challenges in childhood nutrition, at school, at parties, and things of that nature nature that almost always arise. Do my kids lose weight? Some do, and some don't. Some stay the same weight and they grow. Almost all of them eat balanced diets and learn how to strike a flexible balance for all foods. They're almost all living healthier lifestyles after receiving more guidance in nutrition and healthy habits. Some kids see significant improvements in their health indicators. Lipid levels drop, blood pressures drop, and they seem to have more energy and sometimes more confidence. Unfortunately, though, some children continue to gain weight. These cases are complicated. They do keep me up at night, and I believe there are many reasons why this can happen. Often these reasons extend beyond the surface into issues with motivation, lack of support, or resistance. For me, these are the toughest cases, and I'm sure other healthcare providers feel the same way. Which leads us to think about weight acceptance, and I want to explore this topic with you. Some children are genetically predisposed to be bigger. They will carry extra weight their entire lives. And they will be healthy in doing so. They will classify as overweight or obese on the BMI charts, but their health parameters will be outstanding. They will be active. They will be balanced in their eating. They will nourish their bodies with all foods, and they will enjoy it. 
they will be happy, not depressed or anxious. And I say we accept these children. I think we need to think long and hard about putting these children through the system, which includes weight management programs. I think we need to look at the full picture and look at it very closely. We have to look at genetics. We have to look at health parameters and so on before we dive into weight management or any kind of healthy lifestyle program that might give a child the idea that they are not okay. Because honestly, if a child is enjoying and eating a generally well-balanced diet, he or she is active, happy, integrated in the community, why rock the boat? Why initiate questions of self-worth? Why shake the self-confidence foundation? The health at every size approach is an alternative to the typical treatment approaches that focus on weight loss, thinness, and eating healthy. The health at every size principles are accepting and respecting the diversity of body shapes and sizes, recognizing that health and well-being are multidimensional and that they include physical, social, spiritual, occupational, emotional, and intellectual aspects. Promoting all aspects of health and well-being for people of all sizes. Promoting eating in a manner which balances individual nutritional needs, hunger, satiety, appetite, and pleasure. And promoting individually appropriate, enjoyable, life-enhancing physical activity rather than exercise that is focused on a goal of weight loss. So these are the principles of health at every size. I'm going to link in the show notes to the website, Health at Every Size, so you can see this in more detail. The Health at Every Size approach provides an alternative which avoids the harmful consequences of efforts to combat childhood obesity. They base this on some research that suggests that singling out larger children and youth for weight-related interventions in schools increases both anxiety for the child and stigma- stigmatization, prejudice, and harassment towards the child. And it also is based on the fact that 81% of 10-year-olds admit to dieting, binge eating, or a fear of getting fat, and we are now seeing eating disorders in children on the rise and as young as five. The Health at Every Size Way focuses on teaching kids to love, honor, and listen to their bodies while providing them with information, access, and resources that include positive social support, safe schools and communities, quality foods, and fun exercise. For all of the modes of addressing weight status in children, prevention, treatment, and acceptance, I think a thoughtful blend of all three is probably most beneficial. All children and their families can benefit from a healthy lifestyle, building self-confidence, and using mindful eating to guide food choices and amounts. But I think these conversations and these efforts really need to start with the parent, not the child. Let's arm parents with the information they need to govern and guide their children's eating and lifestyle from a place focused on self-acceptance, body love, and self-love. Let's do this at the start, proactively. And let's accept children for who they are, no matter their weight. Believe me, for children who are bigger, active, and balanced in their eating, health and body acceptance can live comfortably together. But we need to do our part to make it easier. If parents need help setting up a healthy lifestyle for their family, let's do that responsibly too, without dieting, fat talk, fear-based feeding, or other negative approaches. Let's steer parents in the right direction and parents steer clear of diets. Screen your health care providers. Make sure you feel comfortable with the approach that's being used. As for treatment, I personally use prevention strategies as my treatment. I don't use diets, no forced march to the gym, no punishment, no shame, or striving for a number on the scale. Just good old-fashioned balance from every angle, food, sleep, exercise, positive feeding, and more. 
So it's a heavy topic. Let's wrap this up. I think all kids and their families can benefit from a balanced, proactive approach with prevention information. Not the instill fear of food kind of information, but the nutritious, balanced food and eating, positive feeding, anticipation-minded information that go hand-in-hand with healthy lifestyle habits. Some kids do need help with their weight, especially if their weight is causing health complications. It's not fair to ignore a child's diabetes, heart failure, respiratory problems, or orthopedic issues derived from excess weight. The question is, how can we do that responsibly, without diets, and with an eye on helping kids adopt healthy lifestyle behaviors they can feel good about inside and out? What do you think about kids and their weight? Sound off in the comments on my blog or jump into my Facebook page. That's a wrap, friends. Don't forget to head over and get the show notes at jillcastle.com forward slash 008. That's 008 for episode number eight. I will have a slew of links and resources related to the show there for you. Of interest to you, I will be including a post with a free download embedded called the Healthy Child Healthy Weight Checklist. It's my own mental checklist I use when making sure I've covered the prevention topics that I think are most important to consider. If you enjoyed today's episode, there are a few things you can do to help the Nourish Child podcast grow. Write a review on iTunes. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Tuned In, and more. Share the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, wherever you hang out. Let your peers know about the Nourish Child podcast. The more parents that know about the show, the more informed and better at nourishing their child they will be. And don't forget, the Kids Healthy Weight Project course is open for registration until September 21st. You can join at jillcastle.com forward slash courses. And if you want to learn more about it, go to jillcastle.com forward slash KHWP sales. And last, I am hosting a big giveaway on my blog. You can win a free enrollment to the Kids Healthy Weight Project, a one-on-one consultation with me, or two signed copies of my books. You just need to listen to the podcast, which if you are hearing this now, you already are, and go to iTunes and write an honest review. I've made it easy breezy for you. Just go to jillcastle.com forward slash childhood nutrition forward slash nourish child podcast live giveaway. I'll include that link in the show notes. And thanks to my sponsor, the Kids Healthy Weight Project, a place where you can learn to be a great feeder so your child can grow up to be a healthy eater with a healthy body and a healthy relationship with food. As always, thanks for joining me today. I am so glad you were here. Please be sure to give that child, big or small, in your life a big squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.